Hi, my name is Julian Kelly. I am one of the Quantum Hardware team leads, and we are super excited to talk to you today about our recent results and our vision for the future. I want to start by introducing GQ2. This is our new headquarters of our Santa Barbara Quantum Campus, and uh, I'm really excited to show you inside, so let's head in. So to start, this is our entryway, and we've got some cool art here. This is our bristlecone wall, where the patterns are inspired by some of the geometries that we see in our processes. So a little bit about me. Um, the team that I lead is a system control team, and what we do is we build the custom hardware and software needed to operate our quantum processors. So that includes custom control electronics that we use to generate waveforms to perform qubit operations, calibration software, which you can think of as artificial intelligence that learn and optimize control parameters to maximize our fidelities, as well as quantum OS, which is a software stack that turns circuits into waveforms, as well as builds tooling to log and make accessible all the data that we generate in the lab. And here is my friend, Anthony. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our fantastic new facility. I'm Anthony B. Grant, and I lead the devices team. My team consists of research scientists and hardware engineers that produce the quantum processors as well as the supporting components. For example, we designed and fabricated the Sycamore quantum processor, uh, our flagship processor that we, in 2019, our team showed uh, the first beyond classical computation. And it's really amazing to see the, the drastic improvements from the early days. For example, almost 10 years ago, Yu Chen, Julian, and myself, as well as others, produced this five qubit, relatively simple processor uh, at the university, even before the days of Google. A lot of the technology that went into, that is in our Sycamore processor today, actually came about from those early days and those early experiments. Uh, beyond the silicon chips that go into our quantum processor, also my team works on the packaging that we use to shield and protect our qubits uh, from the environment as well as the quantum limited amplifiers that we use to read out the state of our qubits. Now, as we want to continue to increase the number of qubits in our system, my team also works on the next generation high density control wiring. And in, for that, we actually collaborate with another great friend of mine, Yu Chen. Thanks, Tommy. Hello, everybody. I'm Yu Chen. I'm the third hardware lead of this team. So my team is called the hardware maturity team. And you can consider this team as an R&D team under this already like research effort overall. So my team work on a lot of things, and but the overall goal is trying to gain fundamental understanding as well as constantly improve the system performance of the quantum computer we're trying to build. The thing we're trying to work on include like individual components such as hyperdynamic gate or hyperdynamic readout out of the processor as we're trying to show you here. It also includes developing next generation hardware such as Crystal. The cryostat can give you a good example using this beautiful picture and here. So the cryostat you can think about as a special equipment where you can put all your cryogenic stuff in, including the cables, as well as the packaging, as well as the process itself. And this is the cryostat itself, if our equipment can cool down those things to very low temperature, such as mini Kelvin. And our goal for the next generation is really trying to build a bigger system such as we can put more stuff in and more powerful systems such as we can cool things down to even lower temperature. So at this moment, I guess you know enough about the three of us as well as the team. So I guess this is the time for us to bring you into the lab and check out what actually is going on inside the lab. Come and in with me. All right. We are uh, in the lab. The reason we brought all of you into this lab is because we want to show you what actually is going on in this lab where we're standing right now and where we're going next. So due to that, maybe we can start with a very simple presentation. All right, I guess many of you have probably seen this, um, this roadmap with this chart um, earlier this morning during Hartman's keynote. Today, so three of us really want to show you the logic or the motivation behind this roadmap, how we construct them, the thinking behind this. The way to think about this is we really, what we're tr really trying to do to answer a set of questions, which, which as we are thinking is critical and also universally true for different platforms. The set of questions we're trying to answer is listed at the bottom. The first thing we're trying to answer is basically, can quantum ever out outperform classical on any of com computational task? If that is yes, the next question we're hoping to answer, let's go one step further. Can we do something that is practically relevant? 
in order to do that, we need to find out whether or not we can demonstrate the path to achieve a low enough error rate. If we can demonstrate that path, we wanted to see whether or not we can keep going to achieve that low enough error rate. If we can achieve that low enough error rate, the final question we want to answer is, can we build a large enough system such that we can actually operate the algorithm we were hoping to operate at the end? So in order to answer those four questions, so that help us to really think about the roadmap and select the milestone. For example, to answer the first question will give us a, the first milestone, which we're trying to do something beyond classical. And then in order to answer the second and third question, that help us to um, compose the, the second and the third uh, milestone, basically the logical prototype milestone and logical milestone itself. By doing those two milestones, that help us to answer the question about whether or not the error correction physics is correct and help us to de-risk that the physics um, risk. And then keep going further down to answer the last question, which we're try, really trying to look at the engineering aspect of this. So we're trying to build a high-level module and also trying to do engineering scaling up. So by doing those, that help us to build a large enough system and answer the last question we're trying to hope to answer. If we can answer all those questions, I think we're really ready to do full run full speed and go all the way scaling up to the final destination. So let's go start with the roadmap. The first milestone we're trying to achieve was actually was achieved in 2019, where we show beyond classical performance on this task with carefully chosen called random sampling. Random sampling is something uh, rather simple to think about. All we have to do is ask common computer, let's run a bunch of random circuit and then see what outcome it is. In order to do that, we were, um, we were able to build basically our first generation of Sycamore processor, which contains 54 uh, transmon qubit. And out of this processor, we were able to demonstrate very good performance at component level across the board. This includes basically high fidelity gate, for example, to start with. In, in this case, two gate is Sycamore gate, and all you can think about the ISWAP gate. And this is non classical gate, but nevertheless, it's very good for computational complexity. And we were able to also achieve high fidelity radar. In this case, you can think about this as more like a single and terminal radar. What that means is basically we can run the whole sequence and run the performance of uh, and perform the radar and stop. We have to stop about three microseconds before we can start over again. And putting everything together and we run the final task, which is a random sampling. And by doing that, we were able to show the quantum computer actually can do something that is beyond classical. The thing we can do in 200 seconds will actually will take quite some time for classical computer to perform the same thing. So by doing all this, we were able to answer the, at least the first question, can quantum computer ever outperform classical computer on, on something? Yes, the answer is yes, we can actually beat the classical computer on random sampling. However, that is not the end of the story. You might naturally ask, oh, random sampling is, may, may not be useful for my day-to-day -day life. What can I do to be something useful? To answer that question, that requires to answer the rest of three questions. For that, let me hand it over to Julia. Thanks, you. So I love quantum error correction, and I'm going to tell you about it and how it fits into our roadmap. So our long-term roadmap, or excuse me, our long-term hardware goal is to build gates and physical qubits that have errors uh, below, say, 10 to the minus 10. And that's important because the practical and interesting algorithms that we want to perform are very complex, very long, and take a large number of gates. The problem is that the physical qubits that we can make today have error rates that are something like 10 to the minus 3 or so. So you might ask yourself, well, why don't we just work really hard on the physics and engineering, make those qubits perform better? Turns out there's a whole bunch of physics and practical constraints that makes that nearly impossible. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use quantum error correction to build logical qubits and use logical qubits to hit those error rates. So a logical qubit, what you can think of is instead of storing your quantum state in one physical qubit, we're going to distribute it across d squared physical qubits. So to the right, we've got a cartoon of a surface code uh, logical qubit, which uh, you can see here we have a 5 by 5 array of the blue qubits, which are data qubits that hold the quantum state, and then a whole bunch of green measure qubits interspersed between them that we use to continuously check for errors. Once we've made this logical qubit, the error rate should be proportional to this factor, which we call 1 over lambda, which is the error per physical gate over the error correction threshold. This is a really critical concept because basically what it tells us is that if we can't make our physical qubits good enough, then error correction actually won't help us out at all. However, assuming that we can, 
we can achieve a lambda greater than one, and then this scales exponentially raised to the power d plus one over two, which is the coexistence. So the way that you can think about this is that once we're beating the threshold, we can then to add more qubits, increase the physical redundancy, and scale errors to arbitrarily low levels. So once we start to think about this, there's some things that we notice, which is that the quantum error circuit, excuse me, the quantum error correction circuits uh, give us new system performance criteria. The way that we can understand this is by looking at the circuits themselves that we want to run for error correction versus the ones we ran for the beyond classical experiment. So you can set this up, but to basically quickly go over it, in the beyond classical random sampling, what we did is we did interleaved layers of random single qubit gates and two qubit sycamore gates. So these random single qubit gates are great for increasing the computational complexity, uh, and they also depolar depolarize errors, which makes their life a little bit easier experimentally. Additionally, we're using these very fast sycamore gates that are really good for generating entanglement and generating computational complexity, but a little bit difficult to use in a general purpose algorithm. Additionally, at the very end, we do a single terminal measurement to read out the bit string of all of our qubits. Now on the right, you'll see our quantum error correction circuits, which uh, we're gonna be using for our upcoming milestone and all the milestones in the future. The first major difference that you're gonna notice about these is that these circuits are repetitive. So we repeat them over and over. We do a layer of gates and then we do measurements and we keep doing that. And the reason it's repetitive is we're constantly trying to track errors as they come into our system. Another thing that you'll notice is that these circuits are highly structured, which means we have to be very careful about coherent error addition. Additionally, we're changing from the Sycamore gate to the CZ uh, controlled Z gate that we're gonna use for our entangling gate. And this is a textbook gate that's very natural for error correction. Additionally, we're introducing a reset operation that helps to mitigate state leakage when our qubits exit their computational states, which can be very damaging uh, errors as we do repetitive measurements they can sort of propagate. Lastly, uh, there is this new challenge of coherent idling during measurement. So instead of a terminal measurement, we measure part of our qubits and the other ones have to maintain their quantum information during the measurement process. So what does it look like when we put this all together? So here we have a bit of a comparison of our operations we use for beyond classical versus for our more recent demonstrations in error correction. And what you can see is we've made a number of advances. First of all, we've been able to speed up our single qubit gates and make them a little bit lower error, which is great. Second, we've moved from these iSwap-like Sycamore gates to these CZ gates. And the performance is very similar, but it's important to appreciate that the CZ gate is significantly more complicated. It's a textbook gate. We're accessing higher qubit levels, and it's actually longer. But we've been able to work really hard on the engineering in our team and the physics to make that gate perform at similar levels, even though we have many more constraints. Additionally, we've also worked on the readout operation. We've been able to make the readout significantly more accurate, cutting the error in about half, also making it much faster, which is really important for this coherent idling challenge. So we've been able to go from about 3,000 microseconds or 3,000 nanoseconds end to end to about 600. And then lastly, we've introduced this new unconditional reset operation, which Matt McEwen is going to talk about in his lightning talk later today. So then what we can do is we can take all these new operations and we can put them together in an error correction experiment. So to briefly summarize this, what we've done is we've done these repetition codes, which are 1D codes instead of making a full logical qubit. What they allow us to do is check that scaling behavior of error correction as we continue to add the redundancy to continue, continue to increase the code distance. And what we're going to see uh, in more detail in Jimmy Chen's lightning talk later today is we're going to see that we were able to actually achieve exponential suppression of error in these experiments and fully integrated uh, error correction experiments where all of our components are working in unison. So lastly, I want to tell you about our next milestone, which is making a logical qubit prototype. So the basic idea is what we want to show here is we want to show that we can beat the error correction threshold. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a distance 3 qubit and a distance 5 qubit. And what's going to happen is that if we're beating the threshold, aka achieving a lambda greater than 1, then we're going to find that this distance 5 qubit is actually working better. We've added more qubits, increased the redundancy, and reduced the system error. This is going to be really important in showing that the fundamental physics behind error correction works, as well as being a really great benchmark experiment for all the integration challenges we have from putting our system together. And this will give us a lot of perspective and visibility on our future milestones and what things we need to tackle. Once this is achieved, we hope that this is a pretty uh, clear path towards demonstrating the really low error rates that we want in making fault-tolerant quantum computers. 
next, I'm going to hand it over to Tony. Thanks, Julia. Okay, so once we've demonstrated uh, the logical qubit prototype, we, we've now shown that there's two mechanisms that we can use to continue to reduce our uh, error rates in our system. We can increase the system performance at the physical qubit level, and we can increase the system size and through quantum error correction, continue to lower the rates even further. And so that leads to our next big milestone, which is what we call the logical qubit milestone. And this is where we actually achieve the 10 to the minus 10 error rates or better that we need for practical applications. So how, do we, uh, how are we going to do that? Well, we're currently targeting uh, a performance improvement and a system size increase of both an order of magnitude. And how do we get there? Well, if you look at the plot on the right, what you'll see is when we're very near the threshold, like we are for the logical qubit prototype milestone, and we're just beyond it, the system size is enormous in order to achieve the, these very low error rates. And that's not feasible. So what we need to do is continue to improve the system performance. And we very rapidly decrease the system size as we move from the right side of the plot to the left. And as we get to around a lambda or an error, an error suppression factor of 10, we now have like roughly an equal trade-off between um, if we uh, decrease the or if we increase the performance by another factor of two, we'll decrease the system size requirement by roughly a factor of two as well um, at that at that scale. But if we continue to go beyond a lambda of 10, which would sound which is very challenging, uh, we see diminishing returns on that improvement. And so we're really targeting this thousand physical qubit system and an error suppression factor of 10. But keep in mind, these are both an order of magnitude improvement beyond uh, the logical qubit prototype. And with this, we will show 10 to the minus 10 error rates and answer that fundamental question of if we can achieve these low enough error rates for practical applications. However, this discussion has mainly been focused on physical qubits and the system performance. But our full quantum stack is so much more than just the processor. On the left, you'll see a, a cartoon diagram of our full system. And as we've been discussing, the quantum processor is located all the way at the bottom of that diagram. And it is inside of what's known as a dilution refrigerator, which allows us to cool below the superconducting temperature uh, of our processor. In order to maintain a very clean environment, our, our processor is located inside of a package, which connects us to the control wiring, which you can see funneling up through the top of the uh, cryostat, which is the middle image, uh, all the way up into room temperature, where we connect it to our control electronics, which are located outside of the cryostat. However, you don't really get a good sense of scale uh, by looking at a slide. So Yuchen, why don't you show them one of our systems in operation? Absolutely. So let's come along. Let's actually see this real system. So this is one of the quantum computer. We actually have one of the Sycamore processor sitting at the bottom of this fridge, which is about 20 millik. And you can see this, is, this system contains the cryostat itself, as well as room temperature wiring and the electronic on the back. And even for such a system, which we think can only host about, say, 100 to 200 qubits, it's already such a big system. It's much taller than me and it's big. And in order to, the reason we built such a big system is we have so many stuff to, we have so many stuff to put inside. However, in order to go to a thousand qubit system or even more, we need to actually think about this system gonna build even bigger and even bigger, think about the size of this room and also you think about the facility itself. However, it's also important to think about other part of the stack, so I will introduce to Julian to talk about control electronics. Thank you, Yuchen. I want to tell you a little bit about the control electronics. So the funny thing about the quantum processors that we make is that they sit at the bottom of a dilution refrigerator, but without this, they really don't do anything. They sit around, they're cold, not much is going on. So these control electronics are really what bring the qubits to life. So what they do is they generate analog waveforms that we send into the fridge. They actually manipulate the qubits, and then from the signals that come back out, we can figure out what state the qubits are in. So these custom elect electronics that we make, we call the aviary system. So it's a creative electronics and we populate it with birds that all have different functions. So for example, we have heron boards, which have digital analog converters, eagle boards that do demodulation, and condors that digitize our signals. That being said, if you look at this, you can see that 
there are a lot of cables here. And this is only hardware for about 50 qubits or so. So you can imagine as we're looking forward to milestone three, getting up to very large systems, brute force is only going to take us so far. So we're really going to have to work on the power cost footprint budget of these systems in order to scale to our next milestones. Now, in order to see where these cables actually go, I'm going to send you over to Tony, who's going to look inside the fridge. All right, thanks, Julian. So here we actually have a, uh, one of our systems that is currently being built out for, to house one of our uh, processors. And don't mind it because it's currently under test, so you'll see some additional cables here, but you really get to sneak peek inside. And so as Julian just mentioned, we have hundreds of uh, control lines coming in from the top of the cryostat, and they feed down into the cryostat, which goes through a series of temperature stages, all the way from room temperature down to the millikelvin stage. And we take the control lines and we, uh, we use these different temperature stages to really extract the heat out of the control lines and also provide additional filtering and attenuation to really provide a clean environment for our qubits and our quantum processor located at the millikelvin stage. Now, what you can see at the bottom are all these cables, and these will eventually be routed into the processor and through the packaging. And what comes out of the processor is our readout, or the state of our qubit, and that first gets amplified by our quantum-limited amplifiers located here, and then through another series of amplifiers that comes out of the system and back into the control electronics that Julian just mentioned. Now, this system is, um, is, is designed for around a 50 qubit quantum processor, and through some additional work, we can imagine uh, uh, densifying these con control cables, uh, miniaturizing the uh, amplifier stages down here, and maybe expanding the overall cryostat, including the cooling power, and we can kind of picture moving this cryostat all the way through the milestone three that we just discussed, the one logical qubit milestone. However, our ultimate goal is to build a thousand logical qubit system and it's really gonna be prohibitive to keep working in this sort of architecture. So the next big phase of our uh, roadmap is gonna focus on scalability of the system. And for that, why don't we go back to the presentation? Okay, so I hope you got a great sense of, of scale for uh, the work that is ahead of us. And as I just mentioned, we're really gonna move into the next stage of the roadmap, where the focus is really on the scalability of the system. And as you saw, the, the, the current system is really a monolithic architecture. And that is not going to work as we need to scale by a factor of 1,000 pat beyond the one logical qubit milestone in order to achieve our goal of 1,000 logical qubits. And so um, here we really want to uh, explore the engineering de-risking that we talked about in the beginning. And for that, we're going to move into a tileable, more modular architecture. And this allows us to move uh, into the next major milestone where we can tile a few of these systems together and show the overall system performance is still there. Uh, at, at, and we now have a clear path toward increasing the qubit number without dramatically redesigning the system. Uh, at the next stage, we're going to build a, a, a small, uh, around 100 qubit or so system to really understand uh, the engineering trade-offs with our modular approach and then we can go full steam ahead and hopefully by the end of the decade build our full 1,000 logical qubit system, which as you've heard throughout this discussion, we anticipate being around 1 million physical qubits. However, uh, during this time, we expect that the field will continue to reduce the overhead on quantum error correction as well as uh, redu reduce the resources required for algorithms. And uh, we don't have to wait to have such a, a system in order to start testing these ideas out. Um, so we, after we uh, achieve this tileable module architecture, we will have uh, answered our last fun fundamental question of if we think we can build a large enough system with low error rates. But to get started on these, uh, these algorithm type questions, we can start to explore things with our current processors. And so with that, I'll hand it back over to you. Great. Okay, so up to this point, I think we have been very much focused on error correction. So many of you, similar like us, we really want to ask one question. Is quantum error correction the only way to go forward? In other words, what we really want to answer is not anything we can do with those noisy intermediate scale quantum devices we have in our hand right now. The honest answer is 
we don't really know. So that's why we have this parallel effort, just go ahead and try it out. And we have this parallel effort really trying to explore application with those mystical devices. By exploring those devices, we're also trying to answer the same set of questions. However, those set of questions, when you think about error rate, as well as a size of system, you really think about physical qubit inside the logic flow as a, as a now. Okay, so in order to move forward, our goal is actually trying to build our system to be more capable and better. That's why we keep going with this increase and better toolboxes. Um, in addition to the CD gate we have talked about and a Sycamore gate, which is a long class book gate, we have continued to develop new gate. For example, we have developed this squat iSwap gate. With such a gate, we were able to demonstrate how to work in quantum chemistry, as well as Fermi Harvard from in quantum uh, physics. And more recently, we have developed this iSwap gate. With this iSwap gate, we were able to demonstrate basically this information spread, uh, scrambling as well spreading over this 2D lattice of qubit. I will encourage you to listen to Xiaomi in his lighting talk with more detail later today. And in addition, we have also developed more and more calibration technique and tools. And we would like to introduce you this uh, more recent uh, development tool called flow gate calibration. This is where you apply the gate many, many times and look at outcome. And by doing that many, many times, we actually can calibrate, calibrate the gate to very high precision. And with that, we were able to demonstrate by marrying, marrying the electronic property of a 1D um, quantum ring. And we were able to demonstrate by marrying something which almost down to a 10 to minus force precision. So for details, I would encourage you to listen to Charles Neal later today for his lightning talk. But looking ahead, we have this um, dual um, effort which will focus on error correction to be primary effort. And we also trying to explore algorithm with mystical devices. This brings us a lot of challenges, go all the way from physics, cryogenics, all the way to elect uh, electrical engineering. So what is the most important thing we need actually to solve all those challenges? The answer is actually simple. We need people, we need you guys to join us. So we need a lot of research scientists, hardware engineer, software engineer, all the way to interns. So if you found any of the things we're talking about today is interesting, please check our website with all the opportunities. If you're interested in, shoot us email, come and join us. And that is it, great. Okay, so with that, I'd like to end the meeting. Let's take a 15 minute break.